Ghost Cult Magazine welcomes in Pete from Ether Coven. How are you doing, Pete? I'm alive, and, uh, you know, it's fucking hot in Florida, and I just got home from work. Actually, I went to the grocery store after work because it's, like, over there. It's out east. And this place called Sprouts. I don't know. It's my second time. And they had, like, these vegan uh, ice cream cone things. I don't know. And uh, I had some uh, mushroom jerky stuck in my teeth because I had to eat it on the way home. And I just got it out. So I'm doing good now, I think. If I start making some weird, like, sucking noises and facial feature, uh, facial uh, contortions, that's why. Well, I, I love your beard. I, uh, being a, a recent uh, joiner of the ranks of the beardos the last couple of years, I don't want to gross our viewers out. But, yeah, I find all kinds of shit here, and I'm, like, appalled. But then I'm, like, not surprised okay. because, oh, yeah. did I have ribs earlier? Mm. You know? Yeah. You find things, course, you definitely, know. like, I had we had uh, vegan donuts at work, and there was one that was powder. And it was, I guess it was just all over my face. And I was like, I got all this gray. How do you even see any powder on my face? That's amazing. First of all, I just want, before I start talking about music and everything, I have been a longtime fan of yours. We met once. I'm going to say it was like Worcester Palladium okay. uh, way back in the day, like 20 something years ago for Remember Never. I uh, it's always been, always try to connect with you and have been a followed your whole career. And, you know, just a real pleasure to see you still plugging away and doing the stuff you love. That's, you know, in this time, I think what we have found out after the last couple of years, no matter what your take on this period of time in the world is, is that like what is really important to everybody is truly coming to the fore. So it's great that your passion for music is still here. It's a brutal business, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. We learned that. I've learned that, um, you know, as you go on, you know, being a rocker dude for, since I was, I mean, I started playing the music when I was 13 and, um, I'm 40 now, Jesus Christ. Um, so seeing, you know, I, I started touring and stuff when I was like 20. So for the last 20 years, you see how things have changed drastically. Um, and, you know, I've been in and out of different uh, part pieces of the industry and whatnot. Um, it's definitely, uh, it takes a lot to stick around, I think. But also music's like my first love above all things um so I, and i may have played in you know several different bands over the last 20 some odd years um but i've always been active uh musically active um in some form or fashion so um i mean it's not necessarily something i want to do at this point it's just something i feel like i have to do to just be me um you know it's it's strange i mean it's it's i don't know i, I it's just such a part of me that even when I don't have a band one day, um, I will be that old fucking asshole playing uh, a steel uh, guitar on a porch somewhere, just being obnoxious um, and yelling to myself. You know what I mean? We are all yelling to ourselves and uh, screaming inside of our hearts, as they say. Um, but yeah, man, uh, you have a fantastic new EP that you self-released on your label. So we'll talk about some industry stuff. But uh, language is the instrument of the empire. Uh, really compelling title, really compelling songs. And it's kind of a concepty release. So I wanted to kind of just talk first about the concept of it. Uh, it it's kind of like a good message we need right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the concept generally uh, for the record is um, just normalization and kind of how society dictates, dictates our norms uh, without us even knowing it. Um, whether it's by use of language um, or just by custom, uh, everything is kind of intertwined in that regard. Uh, we don't really question many things in our lives. We, we're kind of set on a path. Um, mean, meanwhile, we don't realize how like detrimental and uh, how awful these things really turn out. Um, you know, so you can take, pick apart any piece of your everyday activities, um, the people that you associate with. Um, and you find all kinds of different walks of life. Um, it is definitely a strange process to like have alternative views of like mainstream ideals or very Western values. Um, Cause it's not taken very well um, because patriotism and uh, nationalism uh, 
and people find weird ways of being proud of things they didn't work for. Um, so when I ventured into like the real world um, and worked with, started working with people that like, I don't have anything in common with, um, you see different personalities and different political views and you see um, just how exactly they are the American, the standard warm blooded American that uh, wakes up in the morning, has their bacon and eggs, drives to work, probably says weird, casually racist things without realizing um, how problematic things they say are. They believe in Jesus Christ, things like this. Um, and they're very excited and proud of being American. And meanwhile, they've never left like a tri-county area. Um, so I'm a vet tech, so like by, you know, career or whatever. Um, and I've definitely encountered many people like this. And I don't, I'm not known for having, um, being quiet about things. Um, and typically, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, bring things up, but I also don't give anybody a pass. So if someone says some problematic shit, I have to lay it out for them. One time I worked with this doctor and he was just saying like real wildly irresponsible things like, oh, black people are the ones that are on welfare. And it's like, and this is when I was like knee deep in college and I was taking, most of my classes were sociology based. Um, and, you know, that was the bulk of my studies. And I was like, actually, dial that back, my man. And then had to go through and be like, mm, maybe you should think of, you know, not watch Fox News nonstop. Um, bring that back to the drawing board. Do some research if you're really upset about this thing and know what you're upset about and know that the bulk of your money is going to corporations and politicians. Um, and even if a bulk of your money was going to whatever um, type of person on welfare, that's going to someone that needs it for whatever reason. And, you know, maybe this much is going to people that need it and the rest of it, a majority of it, 70% or something is going to uh, corporate kickbacks and politicians. And it's like, you're mad at the wrong people. And I understand like, this is how this works um, because they p pit us against each other so that the working class will never work together uh, and we'll just constantly be at battle um, that way things will just the status quo keeps maintaining itself um but so yeah not to go super far off in this but this is all part of like mainstream ideas versus not even alternative ideas just like common sense ideas like we should have uh free health care we should have education we should have a living fucking wage but uh for some reason we keep kicking ourselves uh the working class keeps kicking ourselves because we can't figure it out and it's been however long like this and we still haven't figured it out and we're still at war with each other because they want to be the team that wins and it's like that's not that's not how this works man i saw this good meme actually today um that said something to the effect of um i'm not a republican or i'm not uh, i don't like democrats because uh they're not republicans i don't like democrats because they're just like republicans or something um something weird like that but yeah, I mean, and that basically mean, says, or I got from it, that um, the Democrats and Republicans are very much part of the same, uh, part of the same political structure. Um, they're just, a, the variation is about this. Um, they're both right-leaning parties. I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, I'm with you on all this, actually. And I'm also, we've lost a lot of followers and friend, fans and even friends of mine have like I'm too snowflakey. I'm left of Jesus. Like you wish you were. I am. And so like yeah. I am unapologetically have always been liberal. I'm from New York City. I was in protest when I was four and five years old. Doesn't make me special. I'm just fucking old as fuck and always been down for the causes. And um, it's wild how people don't ever question their own party line. It's wild how people don't get upset at their like er, like everything. Even if you have a, a political affiliation, you care about. You can't possibly agree with every single thing they do. There's a lot of sacrificing and giving and taking to get over. That's this broken system we have without going too wild off the rails either. But I'm super cool with you talking about this as eloquently and passionately as you do. And I love that you check that guy. And I love that you check people. I also try to check people. It's like part of me is like I was raised to be a live and let live person. And we were all kind of came from a generation 
guys our age-ish. Um, we were raised to kind of like, you know, let people have their feelings. No, fuck that. If they're wrong, they're wrong and you need to check them. They're going to continue to be wrong and spread that wrong shit everywhere. So like, you know, part of me is like, I get that everybody is very polarized and I'm, I'm really trying to be understanding and accepting of friends of mine. But if they're truly ignorant and, and dumb, I can't just ignore them anymore. So I just end up, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's, t- that's how it's been going. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> typically you should be able to get along with most walks of life, but if those people's interest threatens the lives of people based on any number of things um, that they don't have any control over, that's when there's a problem. Um, and white people uh, typically go unchecked often. And there's this thing called white people club. And I've been invited to white people club so many times. And every time someone thinks I'm in the club with them, they're, very very not happy when they walk away and it's like i get you i get you people you have to let them know club is yeah um a perfect example this um this old ass man came into my job one day to fix the ac dude was like a thousand years old and he's just looks like he's on stilts and stuff it's he's all fucked up looking but he's the ac guy so he comes down 30 minutes later and says i fixed the ac i uh n-word ringed it and i was like and i'm at my job um, and i looked him in his face and he had a, the biggest smile on his face and i was like i don't know what that means but i'm gonna pretend i didn't hear it so his like smile dropped a little bit and then i got not in his face but i stepped uh, like a step closer to him and said it again slower and more stern i was like i don't know what that means but i'm gonna pretend i didn't hear it and he was like, oh, all right, man. And he left. And it's like, in theory, I, 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 you know, or, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have responded a little differently. Um, but it's so shocking when people like think that you're like cool with these things. And it's like, don't fucking talk to me like that. Like, I don't know. I don't know you. And you can talk to whoever you like about this, but you're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person and you're going to get knocked the fuck out despite you being a thousand year old man. Um, so, yeah, white people, and, and I understand like no one wants to have a weird conversation with people. No one wants to like check people, um, but it's like you have to, otherwise people are going to keep saying terrible things um, and perpetuating this idea that this person's different. So ooh, we're not going to, you know, whatever it is. And it's like we got to be more engaged and not let people slide about things because that dude that I was telling you about from my old job, um, everybody's used to yes, man. I'm, and I was the only one that didn't. And I was the only one that ever got written up for like dumb shit. Like I didn't have the proper scrub color or I wasn't wearing a long sleeve shirt because they also weren't amped on tattoos. Um, but I got in trouble all the time about nothing. Uh, but I was also the only one that like talked shit to this dude when he would say awful shit and nothing ever happened to him because he was like the doctor and everybody loved him because he's Mr. Personality. But he said terrible shit and everybody just let it slide. It's like, we're not doing that today, man. That's not, that ain't happening. Right on. I know that a, a change takes time and it just takes forever. And some people you can't reach and it's not worth it. And other people you have, to, but you have to, I think we have a responsibility to Absolutely. check people. We have a responsibility and I'm glad that you feel, you feel it still. It's awesome. Uh, I love that. Yeah, man, it carries over in your music, which is wonderful. And uh, this record is banger. Uh, I love the post-rock stuff. And the one thing about Ether Coven has always been like blending these things like post-rock, but not pigeonhole a bull that's not a word but you know what i mean and uh, you know could be post metal it's got some you know some of your roots metal is in there some very extreme brutal stuff uh, but it's really great to hear he's very uh you know moody and eclectic pieces on this new ep and your singing is freaking fantastic and i know you have a lot of guests also well no man i'm i like i was feeling some major david gold woods of you pray and, and uh, pete of course uh you know, typo and stuff I was feeling those vibes because it's a very, um, you know, just just capturing a real great mood that also delivers the message, which I love that combination. Thank you. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. It's definitely weird to play like a different genre of music that people don't know me for. And at this point, we are three and a half, three and a half records deep, which is like the bulk of the listenable Room Ray Never uh, catalog. But people know me as the guy that, you know, sings and yells and says, fuck God and fuck government, you know. Um, and they don't know me as like this guitar player guy, even though I wrote 
the first I wrote the first Remember Never EP, the first full length, the Women and Children, and then nothing after that. Uh, but I wrote all that old stuff. I was the original guitar player. So people don't know that like I play guitar. And um, I, I never really took it seriously when I played then. And then I stopped playing for years and years because I was just yelling. Um, and then I picked it up, you know, 12 or 13 years ago again and wanted to do other things. And um, it's been really fun. Uh, it's awesome because it's like very expressive. And, you know, mo like we don't really stop writing after we record a record. We still very much keep writing just to keep kind of like the flow um you can kind of map out how the band goes for ether i'm saying um so like even though this ep was originally written and recorded in like 2017 um we finished recording it we fixed a few things um uh just last year last this year last year i'm not sure um but um that was all part of us just continuing to write and the last full length was part of that and uh once we were done with this record that we, you know, the, the last full length, we kept writing and we'll have, we're go actually going to record a full length in the end of October. Um, not to jump off topic of the EP because we're talking about the EP, but um, yeah, just, that was just like a continuation. That was like a placeholder for what happened between there's nothing left for me here and everything is temporary. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, it's fun to see the evolution of the band. The next record is going to be, much different than everything else we've ever done. Uh, maybe not much different, but definitely goes into a few more, a few extra directions. And uh, I'm pretty excited about all things ether related. Um, I spent a lot of time working on um, songs and different arrangements and whatnot um, as much as I can. It takes up a big bulk of my time. And uh, it's, you know, expression is, is in my old age, I think it's more important than it ever was. Indeed. I'm so stoked to hear about a new album. That's amazing. And uh, oh. that's going to get added to the list of anticipated things for next year then. And uh, unless you bless us with another surprise release, which I, I was going to talk about that also, but uh, I'll do that in a second. I do want to not lose the the plot on the music because the music is also just, uh, you know, very deep. And I think uh, it's it takes a certain kind of patience. You're a veteran of being in bands and writing songs now. Um, you know, when you're younger, you don't edit anything. You just kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks and what moves you and what you think is going to move other people. But what I love is the, the maturation that I'm seeing with this project and this EP is like, a, like you said, things are going to continue to progress. And I agree. I think that this EP is a really great space and I'm so stoked to see what's next, but I love the songs here, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it was, um, it was weird because like we, we had maybe a, a, a song and a half written. Um, the first song was actually supposed to be on uh, There's Nothing Left For Me Here, but we, we just didn't have it finished in time. So we just kept hashing it out and hashing it out and landed on that. But after the, the record was done and recorded and everything. So um, it, it changed drastically from the original version. I think it's like half the time it was originally. Um, and it's already eight minutes. So it was like, it was probably like 14 or 15 minutes originally. Um, but um we wanted to be like the last recording at our buddy's studio, Iceman, uh, Daniel Colombo. He recorded like Gouge Away, Orthodox, um, My Old Man Bishop, um, some other things. But um, we wanted to be like his last recording because he was moving to Nashville. Um, and we recorded all the music, um, the original version of all the music um, in 2017. And we were the last recording he did there. So we like finished up the songs and then I had to write vocals and stuff still. So I did that and recorded it here at a buddy studio it's weird almost like a like the the moon phase or something because the first song's like super um super soft uh heavy in a soft way um and the second song is like half and half and the third song is just ridiculous um so we did that on purpose to kind of like get all of our moving parts into three songs 20 something minutes 25 minutes or something um and just have it in boom done here it is. Have it themed um, because it's three songs. Why the fuck would, you know, it's an easy, that's an easy theme right there. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, it was, uh, it's, it, we always knew the songs were super special um, for us at least. And, it, you know, we always came back to those songs like, man, I wish we would have put this out and had it done and this and that. Um, and um, we finally were able to, and we did. And 
we finally we got the word from the plant that they will should be shipped to us in December. Uh, we were told originally that it was supposed to be August, and now it's December because everybody wants to fucking reprint like fucking Rolling Stones records. Like we don't need any more Rolling Stones records, man. Tighten it up. But here we are. Yeah, there's also a, a global uh, shortage on vinyl production. For a variety of reasons so we don't have to get into but like that's an actual legit thing so i say to people like uh in any consulting that i do like oh if you're planning to put a vinyl out if you need it to come out the same time as the digital and the cd yeah, it's gonna I mean, take a while if you can put the digital out first it's probably smarter and then give yeah. a very big window about when that vinyl might drop i'm excited for you to have vinyl you also did an amazing collabo uh, uh vegan soap for charity which i fucking yeah yeah love dude that you are still so plugged into that and you kind of always were i think that's kind of who you were always like this tip jar goes to something special yeah. not to my pocket so like i think that's just it's great that you are who you are for all these years and it just make me glow but if you want to talk a little bit about that collabo i'd love to have people learn about that and we'll drop a link in the description too okay i was just a good friend of mine um uh he runs a soap company but also uh him and his wife uh and child have a farm sanctuary for animals that were either meant for slaughter or rituals or were abandoned or reasons x y and z and um you know i if we because we, we donated like uh we ran the rn uh, women and children records on vinyl through over and out recordings and we donated like 500 bucks to shelter farm sanctuary and our buddies in colorado and it's escaping me now because I got this bad brain cancer. I'm going to use it for everything. Um, but another one. Uh, so we did like 500 and 500. Um, and then we, you know, we try to do what we can, where we can and, and donate money to the cause at the time that needs the resources, um, depend, you know, depending on what we have coming out. Um, but yeah, so uh, my, my buddy makes vegan soap. Um, people love it for some reason. I don't fuck with bar soap, but that's fine. I just use like Dr. Bronner's, um, just like super boring. It's cheap enough where you can get a shit ton. And, um, you know, I have like the same two bottles that I've had for quite some time and they smell great. And there's never a lack of, if you want to read for four hours in the shower, you can do that because those bottles are just, um, but yes, a, a lot of people like bar soap. So I was like, fuck it. This is gonna be a cool thing. Um, you know, veganism is, you know, super important to me and has been for, you know, most of my adult life. And anytime I can do anything to help a fucking animal that was destined to not have a good life, I'm going to do that. Yeah, that's uh, kind of the situation on that, I think. Good shit, good shit. Um, just really quickly, I did want to touch on that surprise release element uh, and your own record label, because I think those are important things. You have been on majors, you've been on indies, you've seen everything from DIY all the way up the corporate ladder. So I wanted to, first of all, surprise releases, Typically don't work, but your fan base flipped the fuck out. And I hope it's that hype that I felt from social media translated to sales. I hope so. And um, as I often say, su surprise releases only work for like pop stars. I think it's a good strategy. doesn't always work, but why the surprise release? Why not a traditional, hey, this is coming. Hey, this is coming. Hey, this is coming. Here it is. Because I did like, I did seem to work for you guys. Um, because there was another version, the original version that we made, and it changed so much that we just that we didn't want to have if I don't want to promote something and then the other version just magically pop up into the atmosphere that's kind of the main thing um I think I mean the reception on the EP has been awesome not necessarily because of our fan base I mean I don't want to sound like uh you know super conceited or anything but I really think the songs are the best songs that we've ever written and some of the best songs I've ever been a part of in my life um so you know I think I think we have a niche of some sort um, so people that have followed us or like us, um, they kind of have an idea of what to expect. Um, and we try to eliminate most filler from any songs. Um, I've always said, if it doesn't make me want to like kill myself or punch myself in the face or other people, I don't want to use it. So I kind of keep that same formula. You know, those are just like the, the my two biggest uh, expressive feelings um, is just anger and sorrow. And it sucks, but I mean, those are the things that motivate me and drive me. Um, but I think those three songs pack all of that in there um, to like the umpteenth degree. And I think it translate, translates really well with people, especially given the time that it's come out 
um, because it's, you know, 2021, there's been frustration for many years and there's no sign of it slowing. Uh, and now it's just kind of getting a little more personal here and there. You know, it was uh, definitely awesome to see uh, a lot of people that I've never known to be um, followers of our band and or uh, supporters uh, come out and be like, oh my God, I listen to this and it's incredible. And we sent it to a lot of people that have been influential to us and some of our friends just to list, like check it out and make like a one sentence um, like a review. And like we had uh, Jake Bannon from Converge do one, which was insane because ever since I was a fucking child, they've been like Converge has been one of my biggest influences, whether you can tell from, you know, my slow band or not. Um, and, you know, he wrote some real nice stuff. Um, so that was super flattering, super awesome. Um, you know, just people here and there. And uh, it, the reception has been incredible and I couldn't really ask for anything better and, and doing it, everything by ourselves. It's not, we don't, it's not necessarily my label per se. We just kind of like started a thing that releases our own records because it's easier to have something that you can kind of go to the source. Like we released the tape version of our last full length and we just did ourselves, put a label on it. Um, and the same thing with this EP, we'll probably do something. We have a label putting out the next record. That's not us. Um, so we'll probably do a version of it, whether it's a tape version or something else. Um, so I don't know. I mean, is it, in a perfect world, um, I would like to put out like friends bands or just bands that I fucking love um, that are not similar to us, but not super dissimilar. Uh, something that's along the same lines as far as at very least intention, not necessarily in sound, but intention for sure. But because of to like touring isn't really happening and it's slowly picking up now, but who knows what's going to happen because it's not a thing that bands are doing right now. It doesn't make sense to like put out unknown bands, but there are a lot of bands I would love to do something for that um, may not have uh, a means to do it and distribution and stuff. Um, but we'll see what happens later on down the road. I mean, we'll see. Uh, there's just a shit ton of bands, and I would love to work with all of my friends' bands that um, that I've praised over the years. Um, that's a that'd be like some weird dream hobby of mine. Uh, so we'll see if we can get that started at some point. But but I would use it. I would use the label that put out this EP for that. Um, oh, and a CD version is coming out of the EP from a label in the UK and Europe. And a tape, a uh, regular tape version is coming out um, from a label in California. Those will be announced soon. All right. Uh, and a I lot like of that, is going up on the tape and on Bandcamp. Trying to get the cassette player out. You got to. I never thought vinyl was going to make such a comeback. And now I'm like addicted to this consumerist bullshit. But I also am like the child in me that bought that first Kiss record. I love these vinyls, but it's also like I'm a slave to this fucking shit you know it sucks i shouldn't spend my disposable i should be saving for an apocalypse again not buying yeah. vinyl but i'm glad that you can sell some and i will be buying yours sweet just as we start to wrap this up man uh what else is going on with you beside the new ether that's coming um any any good books you read lately anything you want to share that might illuminate and educate some people that you've been digging on um i've read a i read a bunch of books at the end of last between the end of last year and the beginning of this year and my life has been insane. I've been trying to read this Black Klansman's book for a few months now, and I just have no time to like sit down and read it. Plus, I had to get glasses. So reading was very difficult for me for the first few months of the year um, because I refused to accept the fact that I needed glasses. And now I'm good with it. It happens. Um, and now reading is like so much easier. I just need to find more time to do it. Um, but I, I read um, a couple of books by Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, so those are, you know, anything, uh, you know, prison related or Black Panther related, um, I would show you my book collection. But uh, A, we don't have time for that. B, I'm gonna, both of us are going to get put on some kind of watch list. Already. Um, we already are. Of course we are. Yeah. This, yeah. Before this conversation, my phone is listening. My laptop yeah, is listening. The TV is listening. The coffee maker is listening and reporting back to somebody. I'm not crazy. They're crazy. Yeah, um, exactly. But yeah, that's awesome, dude. And uh, yeah, free movie uh, always. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, fuck prisons and the whole prison system. But, uh, you know, anyhow, we, we could do a whole nother interview just on the politics of all this shit. I'm sure it would be Absolutely. brilliant. Um, I had a wild card question ready for you. I like to Go end these with a wild card question. But 
I'm going to skip the wild card question and talk about this poster over your shoulder because Juice is one of my favorite movies ever. And I actually huh. went to high school with Omar Epps. So like, Weird. I have to mention Juice every time I see the poster. Okay. Uh, that's killer, bro. <laughs> yeah, my uh, one of my best friends got it for me for Christmas one year. Um, and I had it framed. Uh, actually, the old <laughs> bass player from Memory Never. When I was a little kid, it was just always on HBO. And um, it was just a weird movie that was just always on. And like Tupac, it's fucking Tupac. And my old band is named after Tupac's character. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, wait, so let's get back to this wild card question because I, I, this sounds oh, very interesting. I, I, I always ask kind time. of like, I, I try. <clears throat> oh, all right. Hey, sure. I didn't want to, you know, take up your whole day when you just got off work and shit. But, um, nah, you know, I, I like to, uh, you know, I, I, I don't look at anybody else's stuff. So I, I try to do a straight up informative, interesting interview that interests me. I think it'll hopefully interest my viewers. And then I like to end with just kind of a whatever question, just for fun, funsies question. So the funsies mm. question I had originally picked for you was like, wor- uh, I like to call it day job for a cowboy. So like, what is the worst Joe job you ever had in your life? I never really had terrible jobs per se. I just like, anytime you work with people, it's going to be fucking terrible. Um, so like, I was like, my mom had a restaurant and I cooked and I thought that was terrible. And then I got into the real world and dealt with other people and I realized that was fucking terrible. Um, I worked at a... Um, like a sandwich shop or something like a breakfast sandwich shop when I was like 18 and I literally quit in the same day. I was like, dude, there's so much stuff going on. And like, this is a terrible work environment. I got to go. Um, but I don't know. Once, once I stopped touring or I, I started touring when I was like 21 and then stopped when I was like 25 or 26, 26, I think 27. I'm not sure. Who knows? All the time goes by quick. Um, I started, then I got into vet tech stuff. Um, so I've just been doing that, which I mean, the job's not bad. I love working with animals, you know, dogs and cats and stuff. Um, I like working with big, mean dogs. It really comes down to who you work with, um, the manager or the boss or whatever you have, and, if, and how terrible they are. Um, so a, a specific job, I don't think I've ever had one that's been, like, totally unlikable. Um, but I've had many jobs where um, the people I work with or the people in charge were fucking terrible. And I just said, I'm like, okay, well, this is not, not working. I got to. I gotta do this other thing and this is not part of it um i feel like now and you know not to go back to politics and get super into that um but i feel like now the working class is starting to realize like oh we do have bargaining power you know especially depending on the job um, i'm a vet tech and um they they're looking you know vet tech job they're they're looking for vet techs all over from what i understand um so i can throw a rock anywhere in south florida and find a job that is looking for what I can do. Um, so with that said, people that do have jobs in that kind of realm absolutely have bargaining power um, and can say, hey, this is what I need. And you know, even people that have you know, like uh, minimal skills absolutely have bargaining power because now we're learning like, oh, you need us basically more than we need you with, you know, with the whole pandemic. So you're going to start paying me right. And you're going to start talking to me, right? Otherwise I'm going to find another job that's going to do one of those things and make this situation a little bit better for me. Um, and that's a good thing. Uh, so it's, it, you know, jobs are weird at this point. I don't want to work anymore. Like, I don't want to like do, I just don't want to work with people and their problems. Um, Cause in, uh, you know, South Florida people are very entitled to you know and they just want to talk to uh you know service people like shit and it's like we don't need to do this because as soon as you walk away we're all going to make fun of you and how you just acted so think about you know when you come you know um there are people at my job that have talked to me fucked up before and when they come in now i won't even acknowledge that they're there and they just have to go to the next person and i'll just because that shit ain't, it's not happening on my time anymore. You know, I fucking battled cancer. I'm not trying to get talked to like an asshole anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, have, I don't have time for any of that. Um, you know, Word. life was too Word short up. to get treated like a fucking asshole. Um, for real, for real. And I, this just made me think of, uh, you know, you see like trending topics or whatever, the job apocalypse that people don't want to work. No, dude, they don't want to work and be shat on and not paid well and have no benefits while corporations stack stacks. Fuck that. So just like there's no job apocalypse, we're all going to be okay. I know it sucks right now because of all these factors, but like, yeah, mm-hmm. there's a whole gig economy happening 
where people can shape their own futures. And I'm a big believer in that. And so I love you talking about all this stuff. We can get on and talk about this shit anytime you want, bro. Well, what's your uh, job? I work in I'm I work for douchebag companies that I do. Oh, marketing. I mean, like, um, I yeah, when I'm not doing ghost cult. Had? Oh, the worst job I ever had. Um I've had quite a few. Uh, I worked at a travel company run by a megalomaniacal billionaire maniac where we actually turned huge profits for him and he was still angry and just, we would go into meetings and get yelled at for eight hours straight and then not do any work and then have to go work still. So like that was terrible, uh, entitled billionaire crazy person. And um, generally speaking, I've had good jobs or jobs I wanted to have. When I'm not doing ghost cult, I work in marketing. So it's, I- Mm. I'm not sentimental about it. I'm passionate about it, like mar- the work itself, advertising yeah. and marketing. And I try not to think about like the corporations that it serves. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's a conflict that I definitely yeah. have in that world. And uh, well, sometimes I feel like a sellout. That reminds me, I mean, unfortunately, like, it sucks that like you have to compromise your like core values sometimes to like sometimes eat and survive. Uh, but that's capitalism in a fucking nutshell. Um, it sure is, man. Keep going, but that reminds me of like working at Journeys. And like the whole like retail thing where you're expected to sell a shit ton of stuff, but the more you sell, the more you're expected to sell the following month. And it's like, wait, last year we did the same number or a little bit more. Like you can't expect people to like spend twice as much. Like that's ridiculous. It's just setting up like unrealistic expectations. So shout out to everybody that works in a fucking shit situation like that. Cause that pressure where they're always riding you, it's like, Calm down. You don't need that much money. You got enough. Let me get some of that. You know, but either way, ghost right cult. On. Yeah, that's it, brother. Uh, uh, yeah, Pete, man. Uh, you know, you used to be called mean Pete, but it's also nice and smart Pete, too. Uh, thank you so much wow. for hanging out with Ghost Cult, bro. I really appreciate it. Congrats no on the new EP. We're going to continue thank to track you. Uh, uh, your your progress. Keep staying well and healthy and uh, keep fighting a good fight. I really thank you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.